uh, we are calling to order this meeting of the uh, Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee um, at 6.38 p.m., seeing the presence of a quorum. Um, if people are following along with the post agenda as posted, uh, unfortunately, we're not able to convene uh, a joint meeting with Union 26 School Committee uh, due to a uh, late posting of the, uh, this agenda. And uh, so uh, we are going to forego um, the executive session jointly with Union 26. We're also going to forego uh, item number two, which is called potential shift of role of finance director uh, for a future date uh, on uh, January 29th. 22nd, I believe. 22nd? Okay. Yep. Then 22nd. <coughs> uh, yeah, that's the agenda we looked at today, which we included. So we're gonna add, you're gonna add you're gonna add a regional meeting to the Amherst meeting since we're meeting anyways as part of the ADA audit, and then we're gonna go into executive session. Yes. For all of you following at home, this is how you coordinate agendas when it's getting a little complicated. The point is we're not talking about it tonight, <laughs> and I guess we are talking about the 22nd, and it'll still be an executive session. There you go. Both up public and uh, open So uh, yeah. our first order of business then is to enter executive session in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, Hoostein versus Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, uh, because as chair, I find it uh, that an open meeting would be detrimental, uh, having a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the committee. And we do plan to return to open session upon conclusion of the executive session. Um, so I so move. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, let's take a roll call vote. Starting in the end. Sullivan, aye. Benino, aye. Gemling, aye. Spitzer, aye. McDonald, aye. Nakajima, aye. Gosensky, aye. Ordonez, aye. Great. Uh, we are in executive session. We'll return <laughs> in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, we're seeing the presence of a quorum. We're going to re enter into our Amherst Pullman Regional School Committee meeting at 7 11. Um, our first order of business is. Approval of the minutes of December 11th, 2018. I don't know if the committee's on an opportunity to review those minutes. If you haven't, please do so now. Also entertain a motion to approve the minutes of December 11th, 2018. Move to approve the minutes of December 11th, 2018. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any edits or comments or other sort of miscellaneous? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of December 11, 2018, signify by raising your hand. Are there any opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention, so it should be then. Uh, what's wrong with me? Seven yes, zero no, and one abstention. Yay! <laughs> Let's teach math. <laughs> um, announcements and public comments. We're open for announcements from the committee, if there are any. Are there any announcements from the committee? Mr. Dunley. I uh, just wanted to briefly mention a few things in the national news that are um, kind of directly affect a potential advocacy issue that the committee may want to be involved in the next couple of weeks. Uh, one is the uh, District of Los Angeles is currently, the teachers are striking, 30,000 teachers, second largest school district in the nation, um, really fighting for, for base level funding. They're dealing with things like class sizes in the 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a big privatization theme there about the, the pushing of charter schools and the funding of public schools. Um, last month, um, the second sort of update is that New Orleans uh, voted that by 2022 there will be no more public schools. One of the uh, you know, largest cities in the South. Uh, that's all all charter now. Say, um, say that again. So so by 2022, this is the McDonough District decision, McDonough 35 District. Uh, they voted to go charter, and now in New Orleans, all schools are charter schools. There are no more public schools in New Orleans. Uh, and yesterday, uh, the Commissioner of Education. Um, and the mayor of New Bedford and, and the Board of uh, Education agreed to a charter school expansion, which is strongly opposed by teachers, parents, they're apoplectic. They'll be demonstrating outside of the headquarters of uh, Desi and Malden on Monday. Um, and so I, I just sort of say this all uh, because we have our own charter expansion on our doorstep, and obviously we, we, we fight that for 
reasons of budgetary preservation and impact to our community, but it really does exist in this broader context of this, this war that is going on, this well-funded, coordinated war that I don't think is an exaggeration to say is an existential threat to, to public schools. I mean, they don't exist anymore in New Orleans. And, um, you know, if, if we continue to think that it couldn't happen here, that's, that's when it becomes more easily done. And so uh, I think when we engage the community and the press uh, and all that, it's, it's important to be mindful of that larger context. Great. Thank you. Any other announcements? Seeing none, we'll open to public comment. If there are any public comments, please come forward, approach the microphone, identify yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Um, my name is Mary Lou Conca. I'm on the Wellness Committee as well as the Equity Task Force. Greetings. Um, I'm here to say, to speak on my own behalf, that when you start passing out the money that you consider um, that you really, really consider funding organic food for our schools. <laughs> um, and for reference, there is a school in California who has gone all organic and GMO free. And um, the superintendent of that school um, gives testimony to an overall behavior for the better change in the children, as well as their health. It's going to be a lot better, too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further public comments? Uh, in the, uh, it's, I think it's an unlikely event, but in the event that we see people coming in who thought the public comments section would be still open, um, I'm going to, I'm going to reserve with the committee's approval the right to offer additional public comment in a few minutes because although I don't want to you know somebody knew the agenda they'd otherwise have but otherwise I want to be able to move on and still be productive uh, subcommittee updates um, I know budget man right yes do you, do you have anything you want to talk about around the update on we, the we just basically informed of a number of issues with okay. an update any particular fun ones you'd like to? Fees, the fiduciary for the investment funds, okay. capital planning, and a policy, a, defin a list of definitions to be included in procedure manual. It was basically an update. That sounds like a great meeting. <coughs> it lasted over an hour. There you go. And it must have been a great meeting. Uh, are there other other uh, subcommittees that have met and would like to s update us on the meetings? Um, thank you. So uh, the School Equity Task Force met uh, just this past week, um, and we're actually going to be hearing from some of the students tonight um, who are in the restorative justice program uh, here at the high school. And we also have been talking to the co-principals at the middle school uh, to hear more f about their thinking and planning around restorative justice and perhaps bringing that uh, as a curriculum to the school. So, you know, I don't want to take up too much time with that because we will be hearing more about that later, but mm -hmm. just wanted to kind of give a little forecast for the committee on that. And then um, I've also had a few meetings with Amherst Media as a representative to Amherst Media. Um, who has been, they have been working on uh, their capital campaign at this point to build a new building mm -hmm. on Main Street and Gray Street. So they are uh, underway on that campaign um, and also looking for support from the community for uh, all the work that they do. So if any of you feel so inclined, uh, they can always use uh, both letters of support and also just, you know, sharing uh, information about their capital campaign and the work that they do um, here in the community. So. Great. Uh, are there other committees that have met? CPAC met? Not recently. No. Okay. Then we'll, then we'll move on. <laughs> um, the, you know, it's funny. I remember, I remember like a, last year or something, it seems like there was always like a dozen committees colliding with one another, like, <laughs> like a little meteors or something like that. Um, superintendent's update. Um, I shared with the chair earlier that... Um, Given that our end time is slated to be 10.30, I'll defer the update other than the ones that come up in the agenda items specifically below, because I do have updates in a number of those. Okay. 
Uh, and actually, for the for the chair, I'd say the same thing because we're going to talk about the assessment formula and budget later. Um, I do think that um, precisely because there's a real, I think it increased saliency around uh, charter school expansion. Um, that I think we should talk about, I mean, we're not going to do it right this second, but we should talk about when there is um, a recommendation from the commissioner, we should talk about how um, we want to approach a delegation from the area going to Boston and advocating. And in my mind, even though I hadn't done it previously, I'm inclined actually to go and speak myself. Um, my recommendation to other chairs of other committees would be that they also go and represent their committees because I think having, having, we haven't done it before, even when we've won, we haven't done it before. Having that kind of presence of, I mean, I'm assuming the superintendent intends to go and advocate. Yes. That I think it would create more, an, even more of an impression that we took the time to offend, and then we should think about what our comments are going to be and even discuss them in advance. So I think, again, having that kind of solidity and weight behind what we're doing, I think would um, be more impressive than, than not doing that. And so in thinking that the letter somehow speaks for itself. Um, so I'll leave it at that. But I was just giving, it's funny you're saying that because I was actually giving thought to that question over the last few days. Anyway, um, anyone else want to make a public comment? No. Okay, now it's 7. 20, so we're actually at the point where we're going to close public comment. And um, we're actually on to new and continuing business. Um, we have, we're running a half an hour ahead of time now. So I was wondering if we need to move something else up in the agenda. Superintendent? So we certainly could. I'm also sensitive that there are some folks here with little ones that if they could present early, and there are also some medium sized ones. <laughs> no, that's what I'm, I'm referring to them. I wasn't but referring aren't to there, aren't, uh, there, aren't, there, aren't there things in the agenda that we would, I mean, what, what are the implications of the agenda? So I was thinking that we could start with perhaps well being and learning about the Bright program. Um, as the first thing, I know some people are coming back in yeah, 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 10 yeah, minutes yeah, yeah, yeah. for the restorative practices piece, but if we could perhaps start with. Um, that and then transition. I mean, we're running a half an hour ahead of time. Yeah. So my guess is we can we can we can be very respectful to the well-being group and still be really respectful to the sort of practices group, right? Yeah. So let's yeah. do that. You okay with that? Everyone is okay with that. Yep. Okay. We, so we love any introduction? Yeah, I would. Um, so. Um, when we talked about well-being, well, this is a topic I'd like to come back to. Certainly, Dr. Gramacki and I have spent uh, quite a bit of time actually this week talking about this uh, more generally. But what we thought, given the feedback, was for the school committee to learn more about the Bright program. Um, so there was an original presentation a couple years ago, but I think most of the members were not on the regional school committee. I think maybe two or three were at most. Uh, when hearing about it. So there's a longer slide deck. I know Karen Peters, who's here, is going to describe just a couple of the pages because we're trying to keep these to five minutes so that there's time for a question and answer um, to describe what the Bright program is, what it does, and what services it supports students. And I know Dr. Gramacki and Dr. Brady are here also uh, as integral players in that program. But and you will not be allowed to sit there and do it. <laughs> we have a microphone and cameras. So I apologize in advance. but. Um, Y'all look very comfortable, that's what I was just going to say. <laughs> well, good, at, good evening. It's um, a pleasure to be with you. And I have coffee. Oh, you all oh, yeah, there yeah, yeah, yeah. Debbie. Um, my name's Karen Peters. I'm the social worker in the Bright program. And um, I've been here for five years. And the Bright program has also been here for five years. So I wanted to just spend a few minutes um, sharing a little bit about some of the work that we do here at the high school and the students that we serve and make sure I leave a, a few minutes for questions. I do, as um, <clears throat> Dr. Dr. Morris said, we do have um, a longer slide presentation for you that is there. And if there are questions that come up after you read that, I'd be happy to answer them as well. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few things from our presentation. Um, like I said, um, this is the fifth year of the Bright program, and we are a part of a network of programs that began in 2004 
um, at the Brookline, with the Brookline Center and Brookline High School as a response to a growing population of students who were dropping out of school after a mental health crisis or a medical crisis. And so um, now in 2019, my understanding is there's 140 programs in the state of Massachusetts. 102 programs in the state of Massachusetts. And we were the first program in Western Mass. Um, and we often serve as a place where student, uh, programs in the state, in this part of the state, um, who are interested in starting a Bright program come um, and learn about what we do. A few years ago, we held a regional meeting, and I think there was representatives from about 10 area schools. And so that's something that we feel really proud of being a part of doing. Um, I want to move to um, keep going. I can't get it to. I gotta. They probably have to reset it up because of that change. So. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to move through this part quickly um, where we talk a little bit about how we are, um, some of the, the services that we provide. We are what we would call, um, through that multi tiered system of support, the bright. The Bright model is a general education tier three support for students at the highest need. Um, and we offer four key supports, um, and those are academic supports, clinical support, family support, and care coordination. Uh, there are two full-time staff in the Bright program. I'm one of them, and I'm a, in, a licensed social worker. We also have a paraeducator um, who serves as our academic coordinator, and she does a lot of the liaison work with teachers. Um, when students come back from an extended absence, they're often faced with an enormous amount of makeup work and some of the things that we really work closely with teachers to do is identify what are the key learning objectives. Let's not um, bog students down with a bunch of work. Um, let's help them identify the key things they need to learn and get them back in the classroom and get them back feeling like they're a part of the school community. Um, and I think just to back up a minute, the, the need that this program really responds to is when a life issue, like a mental health crisis or a medical issue comes up, we really want to keep students connected to their education, and we don't want them to feel like they have to make a choice between um, healing and recovering and being a student. And so having a home base in the building that um, teachers and resources come to them until they're ready to be back in the classroom has been just I think a very meaningful on-ramp for them to get back into the classroom and feel like they belong here in this community, which is what we really want them to feel um, themselves and their families. Okay, so I'm just gonna move along here. Um, I'm gonna move to some of the, I just highlighted a few pieces of data that I thought might be meaningful to you all. Um, like I said, we've been here since this 2014-2015 school year, and we've enrolled 124 students in Bright. 36 of those students have been enrolled for more than one admission, and what that means is that they've had more than one mental health or medical crisis, or they've had a relapse in their symptoms um, that have caused an extended absence. Um, the types of students that are referred to us are students that have um, experienced uh, a suicide attempt, um, students who have um, persistent and consistent depressive symptoms that keep them um, stuck or out of school and their, um, their functioning is really impaired, students with significant anxiety. We've had students with chronic medical issues, like we had a student a few years ago with Crohn's disease who really hadn't been in school for over six months before he came to this district um, and Bright supported him in being able to graduate. Um, and I saw him in the community working recently, which was wonderful. Um, so we also have students uh, with post-concussive syndrome. Um, and after our third year, when we figured out what we were doing a little bit more successfully, um, the recommendation and I think the big response from guidance counselors and other folks in the school was, can you take students earlier? Can we work to prevent some of these crises so that students aren't in that situation before we know what they're dealing with and struggling with. So we started taking students what we would call a preventative referral. Um, and our, uh, the data I compiled um, suggests that 45% of our students um, from 2014 
2016 to this current year are the preventative support um, referrals. And these are students that have growing absences that oftentimes are identified with an emerging mental health issue, a medical issue, or some sort of circumstances in life um, that is causing their functioning and their family's functioning to be incredibly impaired. Um, there's some other demographic data uh, around some of our students that might be helpful for you to see. Um, and then I really highlighted, uh, there's um, the next two slides from now, I highlighted some of the data from last year that I thought was pretty meaningful. So we supported 29 students. Um, nine of those students had stayed with us um, for the part of, the, of last year due to continued struggles. We had a few students that had um, second and third concussions, unfortunately. Um, and 100% uh, of those students were general education students. We had about 34% of the students refer for special education evaluation because some of the things that they were struggling really rose to the level that we felt like they needed longer term support or at least an evaluation um, to be supported. Okay, and then there's a few other pieces of data from last year that I thought were um, important to highlight. 100% um, of our students participate in regular counseling support where we really work to build their distress tolerance skills, emotion regulation skills, and coping skills so that when they experience some of the things that have kept them home or increase their level of distress, they're able to put some things in place so that they can be in class and be in school and participating in their life. We had 83% of our students demonstrate improvement in attendance. 79% demonstrate stability or improvement in grades. 95% of students reported learning new coping strategies. And 83% of those students reported using those skills regularly. I thought that was interesting that those two numbers were different. Um, <laughs> um, and 79% of the students demonstrated more stability in the presenting symptoms. And that data comes from parents, from teachers, and from our staff. And we had one senior last year. and so. I wanted to make sure I highlighted that that was a little misleading. One student, 100%, but she did graduate. Okay, and a few things that, um, you know, we really um, are committed to continuously improving our program and making sure that we're meeting the needs of our student by collecting data from students, from teachers, from our parents, from the community providers that we work with. Um, in 2016, we started working with Smith College to bring a graduate student intern into the program under my supervision. And what that really does is increase our capacity to provide support at the tier three level, but also it trickles to um, the, the other clinical supports the school is able to provide. So having intern support really is um, not only for Bright, but for the tier one and tier two supports that we offer. Um, we collect data from our students and families at the end of the year with a survey. Um, and last year, through um, parent leadership, we had a small parent leadership team, and they brought the idea together of why don't we create a parent orientation program to really support the families when they're entering the Bright program, because we know that mental health or medical crisis isn't just in the student, the whole family is affected. So we had 11 out of 12 new families participate in that last year, and we're continuing that this year. Um, and we also, another thing that we started doing this year, um, really in response to um, what I know that a lot of our students are working on in outpatient therapy and in what I think is effective practice, um, we introduce DBT and other coping skills every week in the milieu and share those with families so that those skills are translatable um, at home and families can practice those things as well. So How am I doing on time? You're, you're, you're doing fine. <laughs> Actually, just DBT is probably not a term that everybody is. Afraid. Thank you. Yeah. Dialectical behavior therapy, and there's four key components of that. It's really working on distress tolerance, regulating emotions, managing interpersonal conflict, and mindfulness. Um, and there's a lot of um, skills that we can practice in quick two to three minute um, increments with students that we can really help them repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, and another thing that's exciting this year is the middle school is exploring the possibility of um, starting a bright type model um, to support their students. 
Just want to highlight a few other things, if that's okay. Um, like I said before, we were the first Bright program in Western Mass, and we're very proud of that. And um, it's been wonderful to get a lot of feedback from other regional schools asking for our input, asking to come and visit, um, and sharing our resources with them. Um, we had um, a student uh, invited to speak at the State House two years ago uh, with legislators to uh, share her story about mental health and the support she received in school. Um, two of our families were invited to speak on a symposium with the Bright Network a few years ago, so I think that um, our, our students and families are doing a lot of advocacy for the work that, and are very proud of the work that um, their families have been able to participate in through Bright. We have some very clearly established referral protocols, entrance and exit criteria that we've worked really closely with our administration and guidance counselors to really streamline so that people in school, including teachers, know what to do if they're the ones that identify a student first. And very often, a teacher or a guidance counselor um, may know about something before I do or before somebody else does. So having these clear protocols uh, is really helpful so that we can get students and families connected um, as soon as possible. So those are highlighted there. And then I think the last thing I put on there was just a few testimonials from some parents and students that we got from our survey last year that I thought really highlighted um, some of the things that were important to students and families. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I know I ran through that quickly, Maybe so I hope that was... Some questions? What's on the mind? Yes, Zerenis. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for presenting this tonight. Um, oh, my pleasure. Uh, this is an issue that I've been very interested in. I know that other committee members have also expressed an interest in. Um, it's really great to hear more about the Bright Program and to, to learn um, the work that you're doing on a daily basis and also just historically. So thank you for doing that. Um, I had a couple of questions, and it's mostly around resources. Sure. So you mentioned, or at least in the slide, it says that since 2014-15, uh, you've enrolled approximately 124 students in Bright. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, on average, I guess it works out to about 30 students or so in any given year. Is that is Yeah. That right? So the 124 number, uh, mm -hmm. there's 36 of them that were readmissions. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually 88 people. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's from between 19 and 30 um, over the five years that have been connected in some capacity. And is, are, are you the only staff person uh, working with these students on a regular basis, or do you have um, a team? I do. So I there's two of us full time. Um, I'm the social worker, and I have a paraeducator. Um, and this particular paraeducator has been with me for three years. She is incredible, and I also have a graduate student intern. So um, we um, really make sure that there's always that room is always staffed. We have students that come before school, students that come for lunch, students that come after school. So, and we also have a private space so that our milieu is always running. And then, if a student needs a meeting with a teacher, or we have a family meeting, or there's a crisis, we have another place to work with students. Just a follow-up yeah, question. Um, so, uh, but I guess I'm, I'm also wondering, um, you know, do you see a trend or any trends that you could share with the committee? Is this something that is in need increasing? Is it sort of staying stable? Is it decreasing? Like, you know, how does this... Great question. Yeah. So um, I would say my numbers have increased. Our first year we had 19, and we're, we have 25, and I have three referrals right now. Um, I would say that the, the trends I'm seeing are increased anxiety that lead to um, more extended absences from school. So students feeling paralyzed with these, um, with these symptoms and don't have skills or capacity to come in. Um, and so we're, we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, I've had, I think, a pretty stable four, four to six students every year hospitalized for a suicide attempt. Um, so I don't see that number decreasing at all. But I think that the trend that I'm seeing the most concerning to me is how many students with these sort of symptoms just stop coming to school. Um, and so that is why I feel really um, great about being able to catch some of those students early. So when we're seeing those absentee numbers 
slowly rise. We want to get those families in for an intake early so that we can disrupt these extended absences that lead to the crisis. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I was looking through some of your slides and um, maybe it kind of dovetails a little bit. I was um, looking at the referral protocols and um, you said uh, there's a, as I read it, there's a cap on the number of stu active yeah. students that you have there, which I assume is so that you can manage it. And my question was, has that cap been an issue? Um, are we turning people away that we really should be s providing some services to? Yes. Um, we don't ever turn anyone away. And I'm so grateful that we have graduate student intern support, and that partnership has, has increased our capacity. So while that number is still there because we, we want to – be able to manage and we want to make sure the milieu feels safe and that we want to be able to take these students with significant issues. So that's sort of our, our, our bar, but we know like right now we're over that number, um, but I feel that um, we're able to do that because we have intern support and um, we have just incredible support from our guidance counselors and from other personnel in the building. Um, yeah, and I had a kind of a follow-up on the next slide you had. Um, some of your criteria to accept students and um, you know one of them is that they're you know have had outside services yep. and I'm just wondering if we are able to reach out and and make sure we're identifying those students that may not have access for whatever reason insurance Absolutely. family care transportation um, to get those services outside that would trigger you to be engaged here. Absolutely, and I think this is such an important issue and something that I try to advocate for as much as possible and making sure students do have access, and I think that there are many students that don't aren't connected, and that's something that we provide support in making sure that they get connected. So whether that's bringing somebody in to do an intake with them, getting them connected over the phone, making sure they know how to get places, really making those links is something that we feel is really, really important. Thank you. So, You're welcome. Um, I guess I have two questions. One is, um, are students, when they enter into Bright, is there, are they typically, how long are they typically involved in the program? Good question. So it's an, on an individual basis, sure. and I have some students that six weeks and they feel like they're ready to uh, get back to class and they might just drop in every once in a while. Sure. I would say an average student is with me for about a semester, maybe three or four weeks into the semester to support that transition. Um, but I think that the the criteria for exit really is that they're demonstrating stability in their attendance, their grades, um, that their symptoms aren't relapsing, and that they do have that source of support within their family and community. So some students we keep a little bit longer, and then we also try to tr um, decrease the um, – the dosage, I would say. So if a student, for example, is coming down every day saying, ah, I'm so overwhelmed and I can't get here for this amount of time, we're really working to them to, to, to rely on us less and to be able to use things more independently or on their own. So maybe now they're just coming down for lunch um, or maybe they're just coming a couple times a week to check in or maybe they're just doing a little hello, I'm doing well, I got a, did great on my test. Um, and that's really what we're, we're trying to do is, is increase their independence, increase their awareness, and predict when they're going to struggle. Um, and then be available if that happens, that need arises again. Yeah, so the, the other question I had, I mean, thank you, that's a real Sure. The other question I had was um, a lot of the uh, coping mechanisms, skills, um, things that help um, so these some of these students who are in a bit of in some crisis to be able to cope with their stress or whatever circumstances they're in are analogous probably to what other students in the broader population of the community could also benefit from. Absolutely. Um, particularly because the I mean I'm, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, but this may sound perverse, but like the bar of entry into your program is 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 a student who's pretty far along yep. in evidencing um, significant stress. Yep. And so the natural question for me is, and this is partially just out of curiosity, but then it also could theoretically be a resource-related question, is um, 
what do we do to try to extend, inculcate, create experiential opportunities for the broader student body to also get um, access to some of these skills? And as a related question, which is not sort of related, is I'm assuming we, we have ways that we try to ensure that there's no stigmatization. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to me there's a positive relationship between the more all kids are made aware of the positive nature of learning these skills and experiences, the more it takes away any possibility of stigma for those, for those students who need a little bit more assistance yep. in, in adopting them. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, what, what are we doing yeah. so as far as that broader question? I feel like this is, this is such an important thing that we've been talking about so often um, recently, and I agree with you. Um, we just talk, just was talking to um, Dr. Gramacki about promoting and offering some more just general education skills groups um, next semester, piloting that. We've done that over the past few years, um, just really trying to recruit students to be able to, to want to participate. We have students coming to us all the time saying, I'm so anxious, I'm overwhelmed. And then we try to offer these groups and we must not be doing it at the right time to get their, their buy-in. So we're going to try again this semester and offer some life stress groups. We're going to offer some, some other coping skills groups during just the day um, for six to eight weeks to try to get more students involved in these things early. Um, we also, last year, the uh, one of the guidance counselors and I are doing a night for all the ninth grade advisories. We're doing a lesson stress reduction, so helping them identify what the stress response is in their body, giving them more awareness of what's happening for them, as well as introducing them to the idea of some coping strategies. And I'll say that that idea actually came from upper class students saying, why aren't we talking about this stuff earlier? Why aren't you teaching these things to ninth and 10th graders? So that was excellent. And when I say that to students in the ninth grade advisory, I think they pay a little bit more attention to me when I say this came from your peers, mm -hmm. as opposed to a bunch of adults saying, you need to learn some stress response strategies. So that is something that's going, I think, pretty well for the second year. Um, and I think the other the other thing that you talked about in terms of stigma, um, my the students in Bright talk about this all the time. And I have worked in four different school districts in, in my career, and I have been so proud of the students and the teachers here who really have welcomed the um, the bright program and just the the need for something like this. I have we uh, give students this laminated pink pass, where so they can walk out of the room without having to say, "I'm having a panic attack. Can I please go to the bright room?" So they can slide this or just show this to their teacher and sort of walk out. The amount of students that I that I have talked to who aren't in bright say, "Oh yeah, my friend goes to bright." That, that's cool, you know, or I'm going to walk them down there. Um, it just feels very supportive, and there's more we can do. There's more we can, there's more we can educate um, people about students and families and teachers, and I feel like that's something that's a real priority um, for us to continue doing. Um, I have students that, that refer their friends to say, I think my student could, my friend could really benefit from talking to you, but she's not in a crisis yet. And so I think that that... Um, that's that's really a promising sign to me that students are supportive. I don't. I have students whose friends come by to say hello. Students don't feel like oh I'm in that room and I can't go there. So that that is, those are such um, positive signs for me. And um, I think there's more we can do. One of my students a few years ago wrote an article in the Graphic about her experience in the Bright program, and um, we should share it because it was it was a lovely article, and um, I was really touched that she wanted to share her personal story with the whole school community. Great. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much. I, it, as, as soon as I think I know everything that's amazing that's offered at our high school for so many, so many things, you know, it's another oh, amazing program. Thank so, you. So thank that you for, means a lot. <laughs> thank talking you. About this. Um, so, um, you yeah, I was really intrigued by this, this theme Mr. Nakajim is bringing up about how, you know, that just the idea of um, being overwhelmed at some point and having some level of anxiety is such a universal experience, yeah. and that anxiety is such a spectrum of intensity, and, and even per individual, even per individual, per, per day or week, and how this is such a universal yeah. thing. And, and, and there is some, some emerging talk in educational literature in the, in the in recent years about how, just in general, anxiety is increasing for students. Um, 
And so I love the idea of uh, you're talking about piloting these coping mechanisms, talking in ninth grade advisories. Yeah. Um, and maybe this is more of a question for Dr. Morris or Dr. Gramaki, but um, I'm wondering about you know what what could we potentially incorporate into our standard health curriculum? When you talk about health, you know what was health for me, you know, back decades ago is probably fundamentally different than what we could be offering today. And so I'm wondering if just as part of, you know, right next to sex ed and all the other, you know, juicy topics that are in a health <laughs> curriculum, you know, let's talk about anxiety because it's a necessary skill Absolutely. and if we don't explicitly teach it, then we're just assuming that students have it. Yeah. So. I, can, oh. yeah. I can say one thing. Um, we, I talked a little bit about DBT, the, the dialectical behavior therapy that has that, those four pillars. Um, we've been very interested in bringing this more to the mainstream um, just the general high school um, environment. Um, Jamie Knox, with the social worker from Summit Academy, and I did a, a workshop on DBT skills for teachers this year. We got some really good feedback, and I think that in part is leading us to bring, um, Dr. Brady is bringing some folks in to do DBT training with uh, many of the high school personnel who work um, with students in February. We're going to do two sessions on it, and I think the idea really is how do we, exactly what you're saying, how do we incorporate this more across the board, um, in the guidance office, in the nurse's office, in the AAC, in the library, everywhere, so that we're really bringing awareness to this. So it doesn't take a crisis to be able to learn these skills. Um, so I think we're very excited about what, what this is going to bring to us. Um, I think I'll, I'll just add quickly that uh, Dr. Grabacki and I and Mr. Sheehan actually had an interesting conversation with someone who works in a lot of schools around you know, issues around well-being uh, just yesterday, actually. Uh, feels like a while ago. And one of the things they noted in their work, and particularly in high schools, is an increase in anxiety, you know, across the board. Um, and one of the best interventions that can happen is actually just raising the topic and helping both staff and students and families understand that this is occurring, right? There's a lot of, like, steps after it, but one of the things that what, what's getting noted is that, well, this is going on and talked about in loose ways, um, it actually doesn't get to the place where people act the voices of students actually come to the forefront of explaining what their experience is actually like. There was a high school in uh, Western Massachusetts, um, Mr. Mangano shared it with me earlier, where there was a valedictory speech last year that was basically saying this very thing, that we need to actually start talking about this and, and the whole perfection kind of as the goal of perfection and getting into ex cop, right, all those things are... Uh, having a significant life impact on our young people. So I think more to come on that question. I appreciate that answer, but it's something that Dr. Gramacki and I uh, and others are actively thinking about working on. But it's interesting that the kind of just raising the topic, whether it's through survey, person-to-person -person interaction, or, or both, which is the ideal, is itself an intervention of, mm -hmm. of highlighting how students are actually feeling because there, there can still be some methodology of like, oh, well, you know, it's a competitive world. Right, you can, have, you can imagine a lot of sort of cliches that get thrown out around it and, you know, what our students are telling us is a very different story. Mm -hmm. um, I also just, I, I completely agree with that, Dr. Morris, and I would also say that, um, and I had mentioned this, I think, in one of our last meetings, um, for me, the interest in maintaining a uh, focus on well-being generally among the student population is multifaceted, you know, not least of which, uh, you know, some of the unfortunate acts of violence that we've seen committed in, in schools, um, but also just a lot of students, you know, inflicting self-harm, um, a lot of the drug abuse that we've seen, yeah. you know, all of it is connected. And so I think the more opportunities that we have as a district um, to be able to pay attention to what's happening to our kids on a daily basis and to provide support and taking, you know, take care of them when they need us. Um, the better off we all are as a community mm -hmm. um, and just as a future generation. So I'm also really heartened to, to, you know, again, hear about this program, learn what's going on, um, and hopefully find <coughs> ways to strengthen and support it. Thank you. So um, I'm going to throw a question out that may not be able to be answered tonight. Sure. But I know we need to move forward. But um, you mentioned that there was talk about extending this program or adopting it at the middle school level which begs the question because it's like middle school. I think we had a, we were talking casually mm -hmm. a few weeks ago about how like middle school can actually often be the most intensely challenging period for a kid emotionally, um, even though high school has its own challenges that are pretty significant as well. What are, um, 
if we're not doing this at that age, I'm curious as to what we are doing. If we need to do this at that age, what are the gating, what are, you know, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I do. So I'm not really going to ask a question. I'm going to throw that little thing at you. Sure. And you can answer it tonight or tell me let's deal with it in a future meeting. I think I'll do the latter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but let's do that. Because to be honest, I also think, I mean, obviously what you're doing is very impressive and I'm, Thank I think you. we're all, the committee has expressed their deep appreciation. Thank you very but much. It, you're very welcome. It's <laughs> wonderful. But I, I also think, though, that if we're going to have a full secondary yeah. conversation about this, then we got to dig in a little bit on the middle school. Absolutely. Okay? I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. <laughs> so then I think our n next, uh, okay. I'm looking intense because I'm, I'm teeing you up. Okay, sure. For a, sure. a really good... <laughs> A really productive and a really engaged conversation, right? That's what we're going to do. Restorative gonna practices? Yeah. We're going to do restorative practices, and I think we're going to literally move to a different space so we get to experience, uh, for those who haven't been in circle, um, and our stu we're going to have student leaders who are going to lead us. But before we do that, I just want to, she walked away to get them right up, but I just want to introduce the committee to Evelyn Aquino. So Evelyn's back there. You can just wave. There's Evelyn. Uh, Hello. So Evelyn has uh, supported the high school program since its inception. She's been uh, working with DW and then as recently as today, maybe? Was it today? Today was Ev Evelyn's first day uh, as the climate coordinator that we spoke about in a prior meeting at the middle school. So that application process ended, and we're thrilled to have her on board in a more formal role. Um, Congratulations. Middle school. So. <laughs> And I think Evelyn would like us to join the students on the couches, right? Okay, so, the okay, so I'm going to start by reading one of the... Okay, my name is Petua. I'm a sophomore at this school. And I'm going to start by reading a journal that one of the students in our class, her name's uh, Richita, who's a junior. She wrote on the 11th a couple days ago. And so, yeah. When I'm, asked to, when I'm asked what impact the restorative justice program had on me, honestly, my mind draws to a blank. Not because of the lack of information, but because it simply is too much to organize into a clear-cut explanation. So I'll just start with the facts. Every other G period, I go to our RJ room, not DW's room, not the, next, the room next to the AAC, not the, not the plain, old, plain old room 135, I go to our RJ room. We sit down in a circle like we are today and um, we see each other's faces, feeling the energy flow through the room and do check-ins. Check normally we check in um, to uh, unleash everything that we have suppressed all day in every other class that we go to and so that way we're in a clean state for new information to come in some in. in. Some days we receive a lesson from Miss Eveline, or if we're lucky to have a chance from Miss DW, who's out with an injury right now. Uh, a new piece of restorative justice is learned, uh, another piece to grow our confidence and our knowledge in the experience of restorative justice is done every day. Um, we normally check out, and sometimes if we don't have time, we do one word checkouts. Um, here are some of the most common words used peaceful, mindful, excited, hopeful, calm, refreshed, and hungry. Hungry for more. <laughs> I have been talk taking this class for five months now, and here is my overall experience with it. Change is slow, especially self-change. You get used to yourself that other people notice the change for you, which allows you to acknowledge it. Um, from learning power structures, cycles of oppression, and, his and the history of racism, I have unknowingly grown so much. Three months into the program, my, fr my friend noticed how artic articulate I became and how neutral I could stay in a conflict between my two friends. I found myself, um, I found myself understanding the importance of restorative justice in all situations. All of this from simply learning and from participating in the circle process. The other day, uh, during a discussion during, uh, about sa uh, during the Saga Club, which is the Sexuality and Gender Alliance, um, I found myself ranting about the motivations behind hate, like racism and homophobia. I found myself embodying circle and circle elements in my life outside the restorative justice room. I advised people to think, to think 
about why others think and behave the certain ways they do. And simply preaching at them will never promote, provoke any change. After the meeting, my friend told me that she has seen me change mentally so much since the, starting, the start of the class, even if I don't recognize it myself. My other friend chimed in and said that my words represented and showed so much knowledge that they have never heard or thought of it before. That is why restorative justice is so important. It provokes a slow but necessary change in people to really understand each other and recognize each other's humanity. I think twice ev about every situation and the people involved. Um, we need this sort of justice class to spread the philosoph this philosophy, um, this exciting and necessary philosophy. It is not just a class, it's an experience. Yeah. So, I'm also gonna follow up with the reading of one of our coworkers in this class. Uh, I also want to say like my personal experience with RJ following after it. But so you are introduce yourself. Uh, well, <laughs> sorry, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm Brendan. I am a sophomore, just like Petswa. You might have noticed, not noticed, because you know I look a little bit older than I. Am. <laughs> <laughs> I am a sophomore. So through RJ, I knew for a fact that I changed on how I viewed the world and dealing with people around me. I learned to pay more close attention to how I speak and what others feel. Also, through circle process, I became more comfortable opening up about myself. Before, I am pretty extrovert, so I feel okay with people, but I usually understand. I usually listen, but now I pay attention to myself as well as listening. Just like I learned to respect others more, if students at schools are exposed to the program, I am certain that there will be growth and change in arts. And I do a d deeply agree with David when this, like, when he said that because RJ for me has given me a place where, like, I feel open to like share what I want to share, but also hear others out. And like the main theme of RJ is to really like let everyone be heard, no matter how like uncensored they are saying like we want to understand where they're coming from and then be able to share what you're coming from and so not to like argue but more so to know why like you're in that kind of mood or situation and for me it's really given me that because when like I'm in a circle like this I really get the opportunity to like just look at everyone and see them as like a person and know that whatever I'm gonna say next is gonna affect them on like three different levels instead of just seeing them through like a glass or like as a high authority and feeling like afraid to say something because they have more power in a certain in that situation. It gives us like an equal standpoint for everyone to like, you know, just feel comfortable with what they have to say. And that just like makes it a whole lot better for me to want to say things and then apply that kind of humanitarian like treatment of other people in like any situation and be able to like kind of break that kind of power scaling or just power complexion between everyone like I see? Um, yes, um, good, evening, good evening everybody. Um, my name is Omar and I am an actual senior here in the high school in Amherst. Um, as my partners and classmates uh, shared um, in the restorative justice, we have learned how to be more in uh, connection as a community and um, in a connection more of like as a human being rather than just seeing one person as a speaker and just letting their words go away as we mo uh, mostly often do. Um, I always say that at the beginning we didn't know how it was going to work out because it was a new program for us and also for the school. But at the same time, while we kept like going on throughout the different uh, classes and sessions, we became more close with, with each other and we became more confident within ourselves and also within, within the community. Um, and that really allowed us to open up and understand more how are we feeling and how will other people be feeling with whatever you had to say 
as an opinion or as a statement. Um, as a community that we are, uh, you really get to feel <coughs> really confident and able to share whatever you're feeling at any moment. Um, and that, that really feels different because you, you don't often have that opportunity to have a space where you can share what are you feeling towards a specific situation or how are you feeling about yourself or how can you approach a community situation such as something that's going on in school that might be wrong but others like can't speak about it so being able to speak about specifics really makes you see how important it is for us to be uh, in connection as a community rather than just anybody walking down the street like oh I know you but I don't care and I see you and I don't want to like talk to you whatsoever and um, throughout the the months that we've been in the in the reserve this justice uh, courses um, I have really became more confident of, of myself on how to talk about what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling towards a situation, and how to understand um, why I'm feeling like that, and how will others uh, get it and understand my approach within it. And um, I really consider that without it, I don't know if my year will have, will, will have felt the same way as, I, as, as, as how it feels right now, because last year as a junior I was like yeah whatever let's get college stuff done and <coughs> let's just like keep the friendships that I have and whatsoever but right now is when I realize that thank you to myself and also thank you to um, the restart of this justice um, structure and all the learning that we've gotten from it I can personally say that when you are more closer to who you have to see every day you can actually be able to work better rather than just being like, oh yeah, um, let's just do this, but I'm not really confident to talk about whatever I'm feeling. And that's like uh, an obstacle in between allowing you um, to be able to move forward uh, and better in any kind of situation. So um, it has been uh, really, really interesting and really, really special being able to learn a lot about a different um, system and a different program to be more connected in a community rather than just being a single person and moving on. Um, hi, I'm Mackenzie and I'm a sophomore and I'm just gonna read my thoughts. <laughs> um, Last year, my advisor came up to me and she told me about an ALPS class that is being offered to take next year. When I learned that this course would teach me how to be a leader and make a difference in my community, I got excited. My excitement hadn't faded since. Every day I walk into a classroom filled with people I trust and I also come as myself. I walk into a classroom without judgment. I am not seen as another grade. I am seen as a person and I have learned to see others as people and honor their humanity. Everyone has a story and after listening, to my classmates' stories, I can see how restorative justice is a practice that our schools and community need. Restorative justice class has opened my eyes and exposed me to so many new ideas. I learned about circle process and how to solve conflicts and build and repair relationships. I feel as if people, especially teachers, are starting to be inspired and interested in this. During a training workshop with teachers, I felt a shift in things start. I felt like for once teachers didn't see me as just another student in their class. I was seen as a person with the need to make a change and help our community grow. I feel like I finally had a voice, and I know that other young people like me also have voices that need to be heard. We need more classes like this so people learn that they are valued in this community. This class has taught me so much and made me realize the flaws and problems in our school. All the unfairness in school and the non-helpful punishments were exposed. It really helps to know that there are teachers that support this class and want to see a change as well. There's still so much more I feel I need to learn, and this is just the beginning. There needs to be a change in growth in our schools, and it starts here with us. 
because if people can't change, nothing will. Uh, hi, my name is Mosiah. I am a junior, and uh, my classmates here more just talked about how the class goes, but I um, actually went through circle process with uh, Miss DW last year as a sophomore, because in my AAC <coughs> class, I, uh, I met Miss DW one day and we asked her what she did in the school, like me and my classmates, and she basically just set up a circle and then every Friday from there on, we just held a circle at the end of the day in G period AAC in uh, the room that is now our uh, RJ room. So I'm we're gonna talk about the circle experience and RJ and how it's kind of influenced me personally. Um, pretty much my whole school career, I would say I wasn't a troublemaker, but I didn't exactly help the flow of the class go by well <laughs> either. Uh, I would distract students and I wasn't exactly interested in listening to anything teachers had to say to me if it wasn't already what I was thinking. And so that didn't really help me very much, but I wasn't trying to change it either because that's kind of how I liked it. But after going through circles and kind of meeting the people in my class for a real honest first time, I would say, it definitely, it de well, first it deepened all my relationships with everyone in the class and kind of going into the class felt like even though it was just an AAC class when it wasn't Friday, it still felt like I could see people in the hallways or if I needed, I could pull someone aside from the circle, um, just like in class and talk to them. And I felt like they really heard me and they understood how to hear and interact with me in a way that would kind of help everybody. And I would definitely say that I've probably changed a lot. My parents and my family, they noticed last year, my friends noticed this year, and I would just say it just keeps on going and going and going. And uh, just kind of, I don't think there's any negative way you can be influenced by this because being able to kind of understand yourself, especially at this age or in middle school is, I think it's incredibly important and it could help in so many different ways. And the first part of RJ is to understand yourself and then using yourself and others to help others. So I would definitely say that how RJ is now is amazing, but it can only get better. And being allowed to increase its use throughout the school, throughout the community, is just gonna really bring the community together and it can help kind of prevent so many different things. There have been lots of uh, like fights in the school recently more than I've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. My freshman year there was one fight, it's been four in like the last like two months. And so I would say that now more than ever, I think it's an incredibly imp uh, important time to implement the tools that we use in RJ and implement all the teachings that we get. And even though it's unfortunate that uh, Miss DW hasn't been able to be here because she's an amazing just person, amazing everything. I can't say anything better about her, but just amazing. And uh, uh, Miss Evelyn has actually helped us a ton as well and uh, they've both been just great, a ton of support in every just kind of facet of our lives, anything you need. I just know I can talk to them. And uh, I feel even, even like right now, I would say that I can still, whenever I get like nervous or anything, if I see any of them in the hallway, I just like instantly can feel better, can just kind of like lock eyes, see each other, know like, oh, okay, I see you. Or if you can tell something's wrong, we know, okay, well, I'll know to bring that up in RJ and kind of just help everybody's life go by easier. And yeah, I would just say that RJ and Circle Process has been just truly amazing. And I would say that the increase in use or the prolonged use of this will just mend the small rifts that are kind of opening up throughout the community and just bring it into a solid and like stable place. Um, I would like to connect to what Messiah just shared about and add a little bit something else. Um, as he said, there's been a lot of uh, situations going on in school uh, lately and 
we've learned in restorative justice that um, restorative justice is a program or a system to help you um, understand why you are in a certain situation and why that situation went off. And um, we have been thinking and like analyzing um, how can we help with what we've learned in uh, RJC towards the situations that are going on in the school community. And um, it, is, it is how we say, um, since we know that restorative justice is a way to restore and like go far beyond from just like, oh, there was this fight, let's suspend both of the people and let's wait until they come back and hopefully nothing else will happen. Um, it is more of like uh, going in, going deeper and uh, trying to analyze more, more um, and better why both sides were in a disagreement and see what can we do as a human being and as a community to help them alleviate that if they can and if they want um, and also understand why were they feeling like that and as human beings we know that we all have um, we all commit mistakes a lot of times and I really feel that um, being part of RJC has empowered that uh, the knowledge of knowing more about that you as a human being cannot be perfect and that situations happen and as I always say everything has a reason behind it and um, restorative justice has teached us a lot about how that um, differentiates from just like suspending somebody or just like oh you you don't like me I'm not gonna like you anymore no it has teached us about going further and knowing why is that happening and understanding it better and I really consider that it is really special being able to know all of that rather than just like having all of that kind of feelings and not being able to like express them out and understand them at all and I am pretty sure that my partners agree on that as well so yeah um before we go into questions I want to um, so my English for my English class, we had to write a speech about something we would like, like to change in the world. And for mine, I would like to, for my speech, I did it about restorative justice and how that should be implemented in schools and like the criminal justice system and like society in general. <laughs> and um, for school specifically, I was thinking about my middle school experience and I'll, I was a very quiet, I'm still a very quiet person who doesn't like to rock the boat on, on anything or like disturb class like I'm the exact opposite of Messiah. Um, <laughs> I, like, I, I'm there to get the class, get the A and get out and that's what I want to do. And when I was in middle school I was have in an English class and um, there, there were kids that would talk out and like make comments that were funny and would distract the class but they were like it was there were comments that happened because things happen and um, the teacher would um, discipline the kids with the students of color more often than the kid students that weren't, that white students or white males especially, they would be able to talk and the t teacher would laugh along with the student and it didn't sit well with me but because I didn't want to rock the boat I didn't say anything. And um, so in my speech I talked about the school to prison pipeline which I think is important to understand the sort of justice work. And the school to prison pipeline, if you're not familiar to that, it's like, it's just a concept, I think, is the best way to put it, as how students of color or uh, minority groups, it doesn't even have to be like students of color, it can be like LGBTQ communities. I did a lot of research on this, but it's all lost right now. And they all, they're more likely to be suspended and um, uh, put into disciplinary positions than their white peers or their other peers who do the same things that they do at the same rates, but they're disciplined more. And when you're put into suspensions, you're more likely to end up in prison. And if you're in, in prison, it's not a good place, so you don't want to end up there. But if you're more likely to be ending up there, it's not fair. And so we need to change the system and how we do get to there. 
how do we avoid getting there? And restorative justice is the way to do that. And so when I think back to my middle school years, I think about how I felt even, like I didn't get um, sent to the QLC, which was where the kids who got disciplined would go. They would go to the quiet learning center where they would just sit there. They weren't allowed to do their work apparently. Um, so one of the students in, my cla uh, in our class who left, unfortunately his name was Keme. He was in that, uh, he got sent to the QLC often when he was in middle school and he wasn't even allowed to do work. He was just uh, had to sit there and like think about what he did, but he wasn't even told what he was supposed to think about. So he doesn't know what he needs to do to be a better student unless he does exactly what the people, the authority people say. And you don't want to do that because, I mean, you're a teen, you're, the, you're rebelling, but also you don't understand. And no one's telling you how to understand. And so you're more likely to end up in the QLC and then the school to prison pipeline is gonna happen again. So, and for me who wasn't in there, just to see kids of color, especially black um, boys being sent out again and again, it like took a toll on me. Like, why is that happening? Or like, is that supposed to be happening? And then you start to rethink things and I'm not allowed, like, it's not like I'm not allowed to talk about it, but I don't feel empowered to talk about these kind of things to my teachers, to my peers, to anyone really. And so um, restorative justice has let me like think about that and come to conclusions myself. And then the answer is restorative justice. So it's like a loop and it's like, so we need restorative justice in conclusion. Um, but like, then I'm like, I also take all honors classes and in my classes, I'm sometimes the only uh, black female in my class. Sometimes uh, there are only like a couple other students of color in those higher classes and higher classes set you up to do higher sets of work for your higher levels of learning. And if you aren't set up to do that in the system that we live in, because we live in a lot of systems, and if we set ourselves up to succeed, we'll be able to succeed. But if we set kids up to fail, then what? how do we accept, expect them to succeed? And I think if you, if we were to talk to those kids in the QLC who were there in the middle school, before they even got to the high school, if we were to talk to them in a circle like this and let them share their stories, let them understand what they need to know and how they would, um, exp like how they can make changes into their own life like every one of the students here have, like how to ch make changes and be better students, then they might have been able to take higher classes in um, the high school because it's not even just about their learning, like their educational things, like their personal selves. And like with the Bright presentation, they're like, how do we prevent people from ending up into these places where they're like suicidal or missing school or in, or if, even if it's like a mental uh, illness, they have an opportunity to just talk and share about everything they, everything they're willing to share and being able to trust the people in the room around them. And I think that's so important and I think it's so necessary and I, I'm, I'm very thankful that I'm able to be in a room where I can share with multiple people. And yeah, so I think that's, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Please. Uh, going back on to what you said, I was one of those kids who got sent to the QLC a lot. I probably got sent to the QLC in like at least every other class. I would probably go to the QLC three, maybe like four times a day and I had like six classes but it wasn't for really getting in trouble more it wasn't like real disciplinary actions it was more just that I didn't want to sit in my class and just listen to them talk and so I would talk back and then they didn't really want that either and I would definitely say that when I was in middle school I did not feel heard because once you go to the QLC nobody wants to ask you about going to the QLC because now you lost credibility for being a honest student because you're going to the QLC all the time so then nobody really sees what happens in the QLC because they only ask the students that don't go to the QLC or they just ask the teachers who are in the QLC who don't really always feel like there needs to be a change and so I would definitely say that also continuing with the um, honors and not really being able to get into higher classes I definitely would say that now I'm in all honors classes as a junior, but every year since like seventh grade, 
I've just been told and like recommended to not take honors classes. Whenever I asked should I take this as an honors class, it was always by a guidance counselor or by a teacher. Like, I don't know, I'm not sure if you could because I was getting in trouble all the time and missing class. And so I believed that for a while, but I would definitely say that it robbed me of great learning experiences. And this year, it was actually Miss DW who told me that I, w I should do the honors classes because she believed that I was capable of keeping up with the work. And I would say that now I went from kind of disliking school and feeling bored in all of my classes to getting excited to go to a lot of my classes. My favorite class is my history class. I love going to history class, even though it's one of my hardest classes. I just love all the information I gain from it. And that's an experience that I'd never had previously in school. I always thought in school that like, I was basically going to school to do my thing, and I'd leave and I'd figure out whatever I was gonna do after school in life, and I was just gonna figure it out. And in ninth grade, I was actually very close to dropping out of school, and I almost dropped out of school for good, and I was basically just planning on waiting until I could work and then just working, and I was just gonna work, save up money, and help my siblings go to college instead, because all my life I had basically just been told like, eh, you're like a solid BC student, but you're always getting in trouble. I don't know if you can do any better than how you're doing now. Wait till you get A's and then go up. And so I never did any better. And so I would definitely say that, yeah, continuing, Ms. DW, all the RJ people, all the people who understand restorative justice just increases because each time you kind of touch one person with a little bit of information of the like RJ information, they then want to learn a bit more and then once you learn more, they want to give it to someone else because you remember the experience of not having it, feeling lost, and now you feel in a place where you can explain to others how to find themselves too. So, yeah. um, I would like to share about um, me being new-ish in this community since uh, my family moved here from Puerto Rico in 2016. Um, I didn't go to middle school here, but my sister goes to the middle school right now. And I always talk to her about how she feels in school. And she only says, my grades are perfect, but the staff sometimes doesn't make me feel like it. And I ask her why she feels that way. And she says, well, even though I get good grades and I always do my job, sometimes I feel that some teachers have a lot of bias uh, in their like life or whatsoever, and they don't listen to what I'm actually projecting, and I don't feel confident or comfortable with that happening. And me personally, listening to my little sister say that and see how much she knows already about bias and stuff like that really touches me and I'm like I will really love to do something to help that change and like help people to be more open and more connected rather than just being one person and one person and there's a wall in between of like uh, confidence or bias or restrictions and it it is it is really really interesting having a a little sister that's been through a, a different system than what I went to school in Puerto Rico and she she always shares how she feels with me and I appreciate that because it, it is important I think to know how different like schools and like different systems work and how different people feel about it and since I didn't experience middle school or elementary school here I find it really really special So this, um, I feel personally uh, honored for you having come and shared your experience with the program. And I think also, given the stories you share, I think there's also a lot of courage in putting together your ideas and thoughts and being willing to come to do that. Um, I think you already knew that this was actually being filmed. and. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago, had the startling experience of being like in Stop and Shop or something, or Big Y, and having somebody walk up who I don't know and be like, oh, I saw you on TV the other day on the school committee, and they'll make some sort of comment to me. And so the re I say that only because um, I hope you'll be happy 
to know that there are actually an awful lot of our neighbors who are going to watch this and are going to hear your stories. And some of them to me are about the restorative justice program and circles and the value that's been created by doing this. And then some of them are also your own stories. And then some of them are also about, as at the beat of drum on this, because we talked about this a moment ago, um, uh, the middle school too, and thinking about holistically um, how do we improve your experience, your sister's experience, uh, how do we keep at doing that? So I, I, I'm just really, I'm saying this also because I know that we, both out of respect for your time, as well as all for the committee's time, we don't have a lot of time for questions, and I just wanted to say clearly that um, I'm glad you came, but I think also the committee is honored by your presence and by your experience that you shared. I appreciate it. Yeah. Is it on yes. so I just uh, wanted to also say thank you to all of you for coming. Um, there was a comment that I think um, you made earlier about not feeling like you were good enough or that you could succeed. And I just want to say how incredibly impressed I am by all of you. Um, you are so articulate and so thoughtful and are able to express yourself <laughs> in ways that, quite honestly, people two, three times your age can't do, but also about such sensitive topics, right? And to be able to bring that out to, you know, a group of, of middle-aged adults who are learning about, some of whom are learning about this for the first middle time. Middle-aged, okay. But also, <laughs> you know, um, need to hear this, right? And this is, this is so critically important. And uh, I noticed when I first came into the building earlier, I got here a little earlier before the meeting, but there were a couple of books about restorative justice here in the library. Um, and I know those aren't the only two that are here. Um, this is definitely a, a wave that's been sort of taking over and I hope spreads to other communities. But I'm so proud of, of us for doing this. I'm so proud for all of you for being you know, the leaders in getting this program up and running and you know, forging a new path forward. And hopefully we can find a way to continue this program, expand it, as uh, Mr. Nakajima said, you know, to the middle school and elsewhere, because I'm convinced this is critically important, just hearing your personal stories and the stories that you shared of your other classmates. Um, just really, really powerful. So thank you. you know, one of the, um, I mean, there's, we have multiple topics that we talk about around <coughs> um, social justice, but also just supporting all of the students. In our, in our community, and one of the things we've talked about is um, how do we help improve access, utilization, enjoyment, benefit of honors and AP courses? And so one of the things that is we're moving, as, as we as a committee, as we sort of like a, as an adult public face of talking about this kind of stuff, as we continue on it, I can't think of anything more valuable than the kind of reflections that and experiences you're offering because um, it's it I've when I mean, we've talked about this stuff before I've always feel like it's everything's put in a little box and you just deal with it in a little box and yet it, that life's not like that you can be in seventh grade and what happens to you in seventh grade could profoundly affect what you choose what you're both in a position to do but also internally how you feel about taking advantage of opportunities when you're in 11th grade and that's just the complexity of things. It's even like we were talking earlier about the Bright program. You mentioned the fact that their students are benefiting from it. They're benefiting from sort of justice. And in some ways you can see kind of as a full community, um, interlapping and interconnecting ways in which we can improve the quality of our community in ways that are gonna benefit things throughout in many multiple ways. The point is multiple ways. And so I hope, uh, as we're thinking about this, because I think the committee, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but at least in the past, the school committee has been deeply committed to supporting restorative justice, but also exploring ways in which we can really embrace a common agenda of um, advancing all students, supporting all students in a, a very individual way. It sounds grandiose, but we're talking about all of you, your sister, everyone. Um, and I don't know how we can do it. But I still think that whether it's you specifically or whether it's your colleagues and classmates in the future, um, we should continue to hear from you because that's the only way we're going to get the feedback we need 
to be able to have conversations around what makes for effective practice and how do we do a better job. Dr. Morris? Yeah, I'll just be brief. So uh, I'm not going to repeat the comments, although I agree with them from other from committee members. Um, so just three quick things. One is sort of on a personal note, the two of you I've known since you were in first grade, again, something like that. And so it's just very affirming um, to see the, um, the young adults are becoming. So I know that's true for all of you, but since I've known some of you since you were six years old, it feels a little bit different. So I want to <laughs> acknowledge that that's, this is a needed need Were they just articulate when they were <laughs> <laughs> Petra, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but I do, it is amazing to see, you know, that growth. Um, and um, so I just want to note that because I, I can't not do that. The second is I just want to thank Ms. Aquino, um, right, so these students are here and involved in this because of the work that's ongoing. I want to thank Amherst Education Foundation, which supported a grant that mm -hmm. made this, uh, this particular focus more possible. So when we talk about grants and we talk about the community supporting our schools, mm -hmm. sometimes it's the conversations we have and sometimes it's our community partners mm -hmm. who do that. And I think the last thing I want to say that was most impressive to me is that from my perspective, restorative justice is about empowerment. Mm -hmm. And so, I think there were a number of students coming on videotape, as Mr. Nakajima noted, uh, who were able to share some very deeply personal story, experience about themselves, about their family, about uh, how they've experienced the, the school district in the past, how they experience it now. And for me, that's the proof is in the pudding that people, that students feel empowered um, to talk about. And no one, I don't know if anyone used that word, but I felt like every single one of you who spoke talked in some way about feeling empowered and that you were able to advocate for yourselves and also for your community and how impressive that was for me to hear. And so uh, even though it wasn't explicit, my take home from today, my, one of my big take homes is that we have students who are willing and able to be leaders uh, on this issue and have developed a skill set that's not just supportive of themselves as learners and students, but actually supportive of the larger community. So I really want to thank you for that. In, in the sense of number, you're a senior, yeah. but the rest of you aren't. Um, consider this an invitation to come back if you want to. So talk amongst yourselves with DW, Evelyn. Um, if you want to, you can come back next year and continue to share your thoughts and ideas and experiences. And if you don't want to come back, that's OK. You don't have to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be insulted. But I mean, really seriously, I mean, this is extremely valuable for us. It's extremely valuable for us. So we really appreciate it. And can I just say that, you know, RJ is really a place where we ask less questions and try to understand more answers. Mm -hmm. So you, you could quote that if you want. That's on tape. You could quote that. Um, I also want to add that we have a newsletter. Me and Mackenzie, we have a newsletter for this class. So if you, I, d I think it's already shared with um, mm -hmm. most of the people on the committee and anyone else in this room. If you want information, I think we could give that to you. And that newsletter is like bi-monthly, so it will show the growth of the program in this year and hopefully years to come. And I think if you also have questions, you could also send it to Ms. Evelyn. I don't know if we have contact information with you guys, but to Ms. Evelyn or Ms. DW, email questions to her or contact them, and then we could answer them in the newsletter, and then you can get more info if you want more of that. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to put you on speed for now, okay? okay. Ms. Spitzer? It takes a second to pick up, so now yes. Ms. Spitzer? Hi. Here. Hi, Hi. great. I'm very <coughs> glad you can join us again. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. I, you'll, you'll, it'll be available on tape at some point. But in all honesty and sincerity, you missed one heck of a circle um, on restorative practices. It was uh, very moving, very worth catching up on in a big way. Um, but uh, luckily, you have not missed um, item number three in our uh, our wonderful trembra. You look like you want to say something. I do. So awesome. I think um, we'll just need to announce that one of our members is re participating remotely, publicly, and make sure that everyone does that whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're going to have to do all our votes by uh, roll call. Right. Um, we're not in executive <coughs> session, so we don't have to do all the rigmarole of yep. are you in a private location where no one else can hear you. Um, but yes, we have, a we have a member participating by phone. Do you want to say anything about 
I do. Um, so welcome to John Bechtold. Uh, he's come before. And, um, we're happy to have him back. I think telling that during some of the uh, other parts of the meeting, he just went and did more work down the hallway. Cause, uh, it, John is here often. He is known by custodians early and late, um, and we're deeply appreciative and uh, being more serious of his deep work with students. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about some of the theater performances before. Uh, you came and shared a bit earlier this year, and we appreciate um, the update that you're about to offer us about the performing arts program and how many students are served and, and the ways in which they're served. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I agree. I don't. I don't think there's any, um, you know, second act after the the restorative justice circle. That was that was really incredible stuff. But um, I was glad that I also got to uh, tend to that and also hear a little bit of Karen's presentation because I think there is a through line across um, these three programs tonight. And one of the themes um, that I hear a lot and also during the school day is this, this very important need for students to not only feel like they go to a school that feels safe and supportive of them, but they have a home within that school and that they have, whether that's a physical home base of some kind or a sense of emotional space that's really theirs, that increasingly, I, I would say, um, is something that we see a lot of our students needing and wanting. And we hope um, for our part in the performing arts that we can be part of that equation as well. So I've prepared just a couple of slides. Uh, they're intended as an overview. I, I kind of took some shots in the dark about things that might be of value to hear, but I'll try to keep it short so that if there are questions, I can tend to those more directly. Um, so this is kind of a, a current state of affairs, um, the current slide that's up. We currently, in the high school program uh, for the performing arts, have five separate programs, band, chorus, dance, orchestra, and theater. They subdivide even further out, so um, we get down to a total of 10 what we'll call performing ensembles. These are groups that have concert series or performances in some ways. Um, these are all curricular groups um, that go out and perform at least once or more a year. And then in addition to that, we also have seven different elective offerings uh, for students as well. We would call those maybe closer to classroom classes. So that's the overall offering at present. That doesn't speak to the number of sections of those classes or anything, just the, the titles themselves. Um, as far as current enrollment, this school year, um, across the both semesters, we have 331 students currently enrolled, so roughly a third of the school will take a performing arts class at some point this year. 56% uh, of those students are in what we'll call entry-level classes. I would define those as any class that does not require a prerequisite, so you can walk in or sign up from day one. Uh, many of those classes, which is another wonderful distinction in a lot of ways for us, are grades 9 through 12 classes, or at least 10 through 12, so there's a nice, wonderful mix of students across grades, and we find that that is a robust part of what we get to do, is bring students together that might not see each other in the school otherwise. And then finally, um, we have across the night uh, of those performances, 27, I, I just read it out on the calendar, different concerts or productions scheduled across this school year. Those are 27 distinct performances, again, not like, say there's like the Laramie Project that ran for three nights, that's just counting as one in that case to give a picture for that. So very hardworking students and, and a wonderful um, group of colleagues and staff to help run these programs. Um, second slide and last slide. Um, just kind of things on either ends of it. Recent additions or changes in our program, uh, many of which you know, but um, are kind of some signatures for us right now. In the past couple of years, we have added two new high school courses, one very recently. Um, both of those are going to be added to that no prerequisite uh, required. We really want to find in high school more ways for students to have an on-ramp into our work. So all of our recent class offerings and the current curriculum have been focused on how can we create a more open door for more students to find us um, even though it's high school and many students have had training by that point or maybe a dedication, we don't want to cater only to those students. We want to be able to create more options. Um, second, we, uh, starting last year, started a program for dance at uh, the middle school uh, for a couple reasons. One, obviously, what a wonderful place to be able to find kinetic space and explore that in, in a meaningful way than when you're a middle schooler. But then also, we want the dance program to line up more with what we get to do, especially in the music program and to some degree the theater program, in making course offerings that have this long line, grades 7 through 12, gets the students sooner so that we have more chance for more impact with them and help them really run through. Um, some new equipment um, with many things, especially to the AEF, uh, most notably the Digital Music Lab and the Stage Lighting Console that have recently come into play have supported this work. Um, 
We're currently working with Sean and the business office to replace uh, some much needed, uh, it's, this sounds really mundane, but stage and coral risers that have been around uh, for decades and are starting to you know, border on not usable any longer, but we consider those almost part of our infrastructure when we get into our concert and performance season. Uh, and then finally, instrument purchases. Uh, there have been several strong efforts with much uh, support from the administration to replace old equipment as well. Um, our anticipated challenges and needs on the front end, uh, certainly this is not an exhaustive list, um, but some key things that we're looking at right now, we're going to have to continue to replace uh, musical instruments and replace uh, things that are just breaking down simply from their age and, and well-used time. Uh, we are looking uh, to find a way to add some more music production computer stations for that music production class, especially as we find more student interest building there. Um, we certainly have um, one challenge we have space-wise is storage for theater equipment, props, building, and painting materials. Right now, the ARHS stage is also our scene shop uh, and our prop storage and our lumber storage and our paint storage. And um, we, we do really well with what we got, to be sure. Um, but I think it's also safe to say that the auditorium is, is showing signs of wear and tear from those experiences, which leads me to the last one, the HS, uh, the high school auditorium upkeep is still something that we can wrangle. Um, it gets more challenging every year as we figure out how to make things work and click. So that's the broad overview, but um, across those programs and across um, whatever questions you have, I'm, I'm happy to stick around as, as long as you like. Wonderful. Are there uh, questions from the committee? I have, I have one, and I'm yes. sure you've not prepared the, the data. Hmm. Sorry. You. <laughs> I was like, maybe I was speaking at a turn. <laughs> well, you started speaking before you acknowledged, so I was trying to like work on that while you were talking. Chairing. Apologies. Um, when you mentioned that uh, like a third of the students are participating in in the program, which is fantastic. I'm wondering also um, if we know what the demographics of those students look like. Are are they looking like a solid cross section of our population or? Um, are we, you know, making sure we have opportunities for students? Um, you mentioned musical instruments, and you know, I immediately think, you know, those are rather expensive. And are we making sure that students have access to the things they need um, to be feel like they can participate? Sure, um, I can answer to a little bit of that. Um, so I've looked at some of the disaggregated data. Um, I, for what I can quote off the top of my head, of that uh, 331 students, uh, about 40% of them are students of color. Uh, the remainder are white students, which is not quite in line with the demographics of the school. Um, I think one of our longer term aims is to match that uh, demographic of our program to the school. So right now it's about 60-40 um, of white students to students of color. I haven't looked at the disaggregation for socioeconomic status, but we found that that's another important thing. Um, for the data, and we do tend to look at that year to year, I just don't know what it is this year. Um, but that is something, and you're absolutely right to name something like music uh, equipment, uh, our school rental program, we've been able to hold the rental prices for things at a, certainly a comparative, comparatively low level to other schools or to local businesses that rent out instruments. We also have a tiered uh, fee structure for that. And we try to use those kinds of models across our, our program. Um, so, so yeah, so thank you for this presentation. Um, you know, one, one thing was interesting, um, so you're talking about the uh, kids finding a home within the school and like their, their, their sort of their tribes. And um, I've, I've had an interesting experience where my, my kids are, are apart just enough that I've seen over the course of the years, they've each had different touch points with the musical. And um, on the outside, of course, the musical is amazing and everybody should go check that out because it's an incredible production for a high school. Um, but there's like this parallel inside experience that happens too because it's such a, I remember Principal Jackson saying that outside of, the, with the exception of graduation, it's the largest cohort activity that happens at the, at the high school and it brings, you, know, you have the dance kids, you have the theater kids, you have the music kids, you have the acting, you know, it's like all sorts of, and the, the tech kids and, um, and, and such a high level of integration with uh, students with special needs. Can you just talk about that experience from, as like from an educator standpoint, how you've seen that evolve and, and how kids all interact with each other when you have this like joyous chaos of a mix of different, different types of students? Sure. Well, I think joyous chaos is, is a good description. I, I just came from 
uh, before this meeting, uh, the theater tech uh, work, which goes into the evenings. And there are about 50 students around the stage um, of all different walks of life and levels of experience and grades in the school, all hammering and sawing away and assembling things. And if you want to ever get a glimpse of that kind of creative chaos, um, peek in the auditorium some night en route to a school committee meeting. And I mean that genuinely. Feel free to peek in any time and, and see that work happen, because I think we do have a story about process that we usually don't get to tell as often as we like. We're, we're glad that performances work and um, people receive them well, but the experience students get on the through line of that really is, I think, the heart and soul of the work. Um, I was reading, you know, out of the blue, one of those kind of articles about most looked for skills in young employees, and they're mentioning things, like, of course, like creative skill making, team leadership, being able to solve problems on the fly. And we think about in the performing arts as one of the departments that gets to focus a lot on what we call synthesis. There's so much work of analysis and breaking things down in school and being able to see the pieces and working with that. And we spend a lot of time trying to assemble pieces and put things together. So across our program, that process of synthesizing things in a sense of creative spirit is really big. Um, the musical happens to be one of those vehicles um, to do it, and we've been really glad for that. And we also um, are trying to broaden the number of those vehicles, because the musical is wonderful. It's one thing of many, and we hope to keep at it. Ms. Spitzer, do you, I, I'm calling on you only because I can't uh, see you otherwise. If you have any no, questions or comments, you're welcome I'm otherwise. Um, I'm just curious, when we're thinking about some of this kind of equipment that you need, um, and obviously it has a longer usable life than, it's not literally disposable in the sense you use it once and it's gone. It's also not the same thing as like paving a parking lot. So um, where does this fit in our, in our budgeting process? Is it a line item in the operating budget or is it in the capital budget? Where? So it depends on the items. Right, so uh, something that we'll actually want to bring to you perhaps on the 29th uh, is some about the last bulleted point in high school auditorium upkeep. Um, there's some things that could be done kind of a bit at a time, as Mr. Bechtold suggested, and then there's other things in terms of like the seats at the auditorium that you, there's how many seats? Like, say 800? 800, yeah. yeah, so so you sort of have to go all in on that. Um, <laughs> and so we want we actually have some thoughts to share that I think we'd be getting a little ahead of yeah. ourselves now. So some of it would be in the capital budget, and some of these items have been, if you look at the, like, the long-term capital budget, some of these items, high school auditorium, for example, is in that. And other ones, you know, about instrument replacement, those tend to be more line items within the, the operating budget. Okay. Should I uh, Speaking of supporting the financial health of the performing arts, is, is there any recently formed parent booster organization you would want to give a plug to at this, at this juncture? Well, yes, and, and one of the members of it is, is just over to my right here. Um, strategically, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are looking for ways to, um, for parents and community members to be able to be uh, greater supports to us. I think one of the challenges we have is not only money, but also time, and, and for all those concerts and performances to come up, and for all these things to get built and made, okay. um, it helps to have that kind of infrastructure as well. And we're also hoping that that serves as another kind of outreach. I think one of our keen concerns is that we really can make ourselves as available to everyone as possible, and those resources of time and money and curriculum all kind of need to come together to create that programming. So um, we're hoping that that is one piece of it for sure. Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I admire, um, deeply admire uh, Amherst Educational Foundation, but I also, I just think that it's like the booster clubs for various sports. The, I, the, uh, this is heretical. I don't know if anyone's <laughs> gonna wanna throw something at me who works in the district. But um, this is, we've already been talking about how this is an integral part of the student experience, their growth. We've talked about that. I mean, your sort of justice is supported by AAF. Um, there has to, I mean, it's, it's a, it can be a partnership, and that's very healthy, but the reality is there has to be also, if you're especially looking for capital items, looking out over 10 years, we have to work these, some, of these, some of these things into, or some portion of these things, into our capital budget as well. It can't just be relied upon for you know, the enormous generosity and commitment of our community. I don't think, I mean, I'm pretty much saying this, but I don't think it's appropriate. I mean, it's just, we have a different subject of fees on our on our agenda as well. And to me, um, the 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 notion of moving out of the core curriculum 
and essentially creating what might otherwise feel like luxury items out of things that are in fact integral to a high quality educational experience is, um, is problematic. Uh, by the way, how many participate this year in the uh, Music Lab? Um, we're still racking up numbers because we just finished. It looks like we'll be around 150 or so. And what, is there a range of like projects that are coming out of it in terms of students just sort of learning and others who are going to record a hit album? <laughs> Always. Um, are, are you talking about the school musical or the music program? Just no, I'm talking clear. about the yeah. Digital music oh, the musical lab. digital music lab. Oh, that um, that um, the goal right now is to get more students in. It's still a young course, so we're mm -hmm. trying to build up enough capacity to look towards maybe um, advancing to a next tier course if we can. We might experiment uh, with um, some Alps next year that look at that kind of option. We definitely want to invite students into that. That is such a perfect example of how technology and curriculum and an invitation for new students to feel like they can be creators is really huge. Um, one of our big challenges, I would say, at the high school is how do we support students in the curricular day to have those experiences as young creators? Um, as wonderful, wonderful as the things like the musical are, they are extracurricular, technically. Yeah. Um, and that does limit uh, certain kinds of student participation, students that don't have that time or ability to make their... So when we get to something like the Digital Music Lab, we can really kind of put our money where our mouth is. Cool. Is there a donia's then, Mr. Menino? Um, thank you. I didn't even know you noticed. But <laughs> <laughs> I paid attention. The magic chair. Um, I was just struck recently, you know, these kinds of comments are, are sometimes not helpful, so please excuse me, but um, there was a video that was on social media just a couple months ago of a, a district in uh, Cape Cod, I believe, that was uh, sort of doing a welcome back to school community, and the students actually performed this incredible, did you see this? Um, no. I don't remember what the, the song was, but they did this incredible version of like a, you know, a pop song. Um, but it was basically the entire, like, you know, uh, theater, uh, you know, student groups and their, you know, chorus groups. And, and uh, it was just a huge, like, all-school uh, process. But it just struck me as Mr. Nakajima was talking about uh, the importance of incorporating your needs into our capital planning and, you know, and a uh, more formal budget uh, process. Simultaneously, I think, um, and we've talked about this before, is the need to really promote this, you know, the program that's going on here at the high school because it is so incredible and so many people get excited about it when they hear it and see it. Um, so I'm wondering if there, if any thought has been given to promoting um, the, you know, the programs in, in more formal ways and adding that to the budget. So thinking about ways of, you know, uh, whether it's promotional stuff that happens downtown, I know that usually they kind of, sort of string the banner across, mm. you know, Main Street or whatever. Um, but doing more things like that to sort of build excitement throughout the year, help uh, both students and families know what's going on in here from day to day. And if they're not already members of, you know, one of the, the groups that you preside over, uh, to consider it, you know, and to, to strongly uh, encourage their participation and their involvement because, again, for so many different reasons, you know, both educational but also social-emotional and, um, you know, mental well-being. We were talking a lot about that just recently tonight. Uh, you know, it seems like theater and, you know, theater-related activities help promote all of those things so, so much that mm. uh, it's worth pursuing in a more promotional way, I guess, than, than maybe we, we are prone to do. I think so too, um, and I appreciate your, your comments on that because there is something about the visibility of the program that's really integral to our success. And by that I mean I think there are students that are very tapped in uh, to that world. It's almost like they can receive the information telepathically at this point about what's going to happen next. And then there are students that have no clue that there really even is a theater program or dance program. And I would say that is something that we need to do more work on right now, both within the school but also within the community. So I, I think that's a really pertinent point. I think it also speaks back to one of our challenges, which is feeling spread thin on the stuff we currently offer, and where do you also bring that in? But we recognize that if we're going to continue to grow and indeed kind of match that, that longer-term goal of our program's demographics being the school demographics, that's going to be integral to that. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Ms. Marina? For the second time this evening, an acronym has been used. What is ELPS? Oh, I'm very sorry. Um, alternate learning, alternative learning program. Do I get that right? Yeah. Okay. So well, it's, it's basically an independent study would be a shorthand for it. It's a way for a student or a group of students um, to work with a teacher um, above and beyond the curricular classes. Like an independent on a, study. Yeah, and often for credit of some kind. Yeah. Wonderful. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here, by the way, at 9.05 in the evening. <laughs> as as to you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks so much. Great. Great. Uh, so the uh, it looks like we have a, uh, a run through of a number of Shamangano specials, right? It's nine o'clock, so yeah. <laughs> 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 well, we have to have our um, I, That might that might be a slight um, a slight dig at, at um, the uh, agenda setting. No, for no, no. That's no? Right. So we're always making you hang out till night. We... I learn a lot by doing. Uh, I learn a lot that I wouldn't otherwise learn. Welcome. So the item, next item is school choice hearing. I can, I don't think, yeah, this one I can do. So this is an opportunity for the varied members of the public who are here to share their thoughts and opinions. So the, uh, every, uh, Fred can certainly share his. Um, so this is, uh, in Massachusetts, every district has to have a school choice hearing each year and then vote on school choice at the following meeting. Um, so we have to reopen public comment to do that. So then I hereby, uh, reopen public comment for the purposes of a hearing upon the adoption by our school district of school choice. Uh, anyone who's interested in making a comment, feel free to come to the microphone. Please identify yourself and you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, we welcome your comments now. Seeing that no presence of uh, nobody speaking, uh, Ms. Spitzer, there's nobody here speaking to speak. Uh, we hereby close the hearing um, and uh, I guess welcome any written comments somebody might have who sees us on television if they have it. Um, item C on our agenda is assessment formula and budget. People might have noticed in their packets a series of um, spreadsheets and information that um, are fascinating. Mr. Mangano. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just do a quick explanation of what's in your packet. Um, so a core group, an advisory group of sorts, uh, met, I think, two weeks ago now. Um, Mr. Nakajima, uh, Superintendent Morris, and representatives from the other towns um, met to discuss the assessment method issue for this coming year. And so out of that meeting, a couple op we put together a couple options from which this meet group is going to meet again next week, I think, and review those options. So. I'll go quickly over what those options are and then any questions you may have. So option A that you're looking at um, allocates 34% of the assessment based on EQV, which is property values in each member town, and the remaining 66% based on a five-year rolling average of enrollment. The new concept we've rolled into sort of all of these options is having um, a, a floor built into the assessment method so that you know, some of the issues we've had in the past is one town will go way up and one town will go way down, and there's like this, you know, where if we could bring them both closer to the middle, um, we might have a, a method that works better for everybody. So we try to put in a floor that will help do that. Um, so in this case, it's a 1% floor. It really only applies to the smaller towns because Amherst assessment never seems to go down uh, just because of the, the variables that play into it. Um, so really it only applies to the smaller towns. These are all alternatives to the statutory method? Yes, yep. Right, so if, if the way the assessment method worked out, let's say Pelham was going to go down 5%, their assessment was going to go down 5% from the prior year, um, we put in a floor of 1%. So the most it could go down is 1%, and that difference would then be reallocated to whatever town's assessment is going up the most. So again, the objective was to try to bring everyone to the middle and not have this huge sort of disparity. So if uh, we are following the bouncing ball on these pieces of paper, the column loop we should be paying attention to is the middle one because that's been adjusted for that floor that you just spoke of. Right, yeah. For example, Shootsbury yeah. minus 3% in the purple column, but it goes to minus 1% in the middle column. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yep, yeah, so the way these are oriented is the blue is sort of the, the base that you're comparing it to. The gray, or I'm not sure what it looks like in here, is purple, um, is what the assessment would be with no adjustment or no floor. Um, the green is if there is, need, is there if there's an adjustment required based on whatever method it is. That's what the adjust, adjustment would look like, and the assessment increases. Um, the white is just informational to give you a sense of what the um, variables are that are in the assessment method. And then there was a request to put in what the per pupil cost is uh, for each method. 
So that was option A. Option B um, is just a straight allocation of the assessment based on a five-year rolling average of enrollment. So this is sort of the method that's in our regional agreement currently. Um, wanted to look at what that would, what results that would look like um, if we had this floor in place, which we haven't in the past. So this is what the assessments would look like. And it's illustrative, it's not intended, it's not expected, anticipated that the towns would agree to adopt this. Right. Yeah, it kind of gives a one baseline to look at. Man. Are any of these alternatives the method currently used this year? Yeah, they, yep, they all are. Meaning they're alternatives, like none of these are the method we're using this year. So the method we use this year is a 20% minimum contribution. You don't have the method that we use this No, year. we try to look for other methods. Um, okay. That method is still on the table as sort of a fallback, but we try to look at other methods that might be have more support. And then the last one is sort of a, a new concept that we're playing around with that might help, might not help. Um, so one of the issues we've always had in the past is Amherst is so different from the smaller towns, and so whenever we try to use any variable to sort of get the you know result that feels right, it doesn't work because the, the scale is just so different. Um, so this option allocates Amherst's assessment based on one variable, and then whatever's left over, it allocates to the remaining towns based on a different variable. So in this case, Amherst is allocated based on enrollment, and then the amount left over is, is allocated based on, I think it's one-third minimum contribution, which is the, the state's um, wealth formula, and then two-thirds enrollment. And so you can see the increases this produces, um, or, the, or the assessment changes it produces, which aren't bad compared to some of the options we've looked at in terms of are they manageable for the towns. It's really, are they manageable and is the logic or the rationale um, something they can support? Mr. Emily? Uh, can you remind me again what the guidance was from uh, Amherst? Uh, for this year, yeah. I think two and a half percent. The assessment increase guidance? Yeah. yeah. Mr. Redan? Have the town representatives discussed any of these yet, or they're going to? We're going to. Yeah. They have it. We sent it out for them to look at. <laughs> sort of laugh. It looks like you're de desperately no, wanting to raise these, your hands. Yeah. No, I'm. Uh, I mean, I I think, Mr. Dennis. Uh, yeah, but it's well. I guess. I thought you were pausing. No, I was explaining that I was. Um, oh, I'm pausing sorry. Pausing between hand raising. Oh, I'm sorry. Being okay. Polite. <laughs> well, that was very polite of you. Then just keep the questions. Please, please continue. Um, so I'll hold my my comment until Mr. Dumling finishes. You know, so I'm trying to absorb this in the context of what is politically viable, mm -hmm. because obviously at the end of the day, this is what can four towns agree to. Yeah. And so the reason why I was asking about the um, guidance plus from Amherst for two and a half is I'm looking at the percentages for Amherst. So 271, 3.13, 3.14. Mm -hmm. um, they're all above two and a half. Right. Uh, 271 is the closest, and yet that is the one that has the highest increase for um, I'll just say it directly, the town that has had the most um, concerns about uh, assessment methods recently. Uh, and so I'm, I'm struggling to see which of these might be the most politically viable, although you all have looked at these numbers a lot longer than I have, so maybe you've seen something that. Right. Yeah, so we'll have to work with the town to see what they can support, you know, if it can go above that 2.5% guidance or if it has to. Um, I think this year in particular, you know, one of the things I always say is, their assessment might go up no matter what assessment method we use, and this is one, a good example of a year like that because their enrollment is going up, Amherst enrollment's going up, and the statutory or the minimum contribution piece is going up for Amherst too because of their property values. So really, both measures that are sort of, you know, drive all, most of the assessment methods, it's going up for Amherst. So there's really no way to, there's not a way that is sort of logical to get that down to the 2.5% if the we're looking at level services. One of the challenges uh, that we had coming out of the four town meeting was that, uh, and this was reiterated at the small group meeting we had, that there was a general level of dissatisfaction at um, having an entirely ad hoc methodology. Meaning, in other words, just sort of saying, let's pick percentages. At, so this, so just to remind the committee, the really good news is all the towns are on board with a level funded budget for us. So that's, in my opinion, anyways, and I think it was in the committee's opinion, that's exceptionally good news. Figuring out now how to get to an agreed upon formula that fulfills their state and commitment to try to get us level funded is the challenge, right? Um, so we're starting from kind of a good place, and 
one of the things that was expressed by the towns in at least our small group meeting was an opposition to having a wholly arbitrary pick percentages out of a hat and make them all sort of work out thing. And so the challenge that we're facing, and the state is also, you, you I think the committee knows this, the state has also expressed their dissatisfaction of um, the, the district being completely ad hoc with its formulas and wanting it to be based on something but also ideally lead to a permanent solution. And so um, the challenge I think that Mr. Demling, you're appropriately identifying is they're, they're part of the discussion is figuring out how do we get to the towns to agree on something that squares that circle if squaring that circle doesn't actually align with what their original guidance was and um, it may not it may land in a different place yeah and just on that point I don't want to belabor the conversation uh, to go deeper but I know I've heard from two towns now who are also asking you know so you see that Mr. Mangano has presented a floor and could there be a ceiling as well so the way so floors and ceilings work is they're a leveling mechanism um, that can be utilized uh, effectively. Um, I'm not suggesting that we should or should do that, but it's an, other people are noticing the same thing that you're noting and trying to figure out common sense solutions of how we might be able to approach that. So I think everyone's sort of on the same page of we got to get to a more permanent solution and what's a way to do that that perhaps levels some of the some of the differences. Yeah, and without I mean without thinking that there is a solution right now, just to put an even finer point on that. The, 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 question, the point about floors and ceilings came up uh, under the, um, the topic of saying, uh, look, we've got to come up with final, uh, you know, a final formula that we can agree to. Nothing really feels right. Everything causes years to year gyrations. Um, and one, if one town's ox isn't getting gored this year, then, it, then it's getting gored next year or the year after next. What do we do about this? And that led us to a place that actually a number of years ago, I guess, um, there had been a proposal to have, you know, floors and ceilings in, in these um, formulas to base as a backstop to say, let's find a way to do something that no one really, frankly, it's unpalatable. No one really likes doing it. No one really likes living with it. And people really don't like it. When, towns really don't like it when the, the numbers change radically. But we got to come up with something. And so this is trying to uh, respect that reality. Um, is it Donia, you said you had something you wanted to say earlier. Uh, I guess more of a question. I mean, I think, you know, um, obviously a lot of thinking and work went into preparing these, and, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of conversations taking place with the towns in between, you know, the, the, the four towns meeting uh, and today. Um, I'm curious if there's any one preferred assessment method that seems to be coming out ahead of the others in, in your mind, given, you know, what you know about our finances mm -hmm. and town finances and all of that? Or would you rather not say? I think I'd rather wait till the group meets one more time and we go through it and I kind of get the feedback um, from them. I think these were sort of trials uh, to see what the numbers came back, um, see what numbers came back, and if in the future years they look like they're manageable. Um, but I think I want to get sort of that feedback first before. Well, can I put the question in another sure, way, maybe? Yeah. Um, so are there any, is there any assessment method or any assessment methods that you just can't live with? Like, that, that you know, if, if it would happen, it would be devastating, right? We've, we've kind of teetered on that conversation yeah. before. I mean, I think truly this going to the full statutory method is the one where, you know, we may be headed there. Um, but when we look at the volatility from year to year, that's where you get the, the real volatility. Um, with the statutory with method. With the full statutory method. Yeah. So if we can't all agree on something else, um, that's probably where we're going to end up. Um, and that's the one where, from a budgeting standpoint, it's no good. <laughs> um, you know, from a projecting standpoint, it's no good. Um, and most likely, one or two towns are going to get hit really hard every year or every other year. Um, so that's sort of, for me, the worst, sort of the worst case scenario. So, I mean, and, you know, and I... It strikes me that we haven't, we've sort of said that, and we've said it the way that you've just said it now, and it, and it feels like maybe we need to say that a little more clearly mm -hmm. and more strongly, right? That this is severely detrimental if we go to that method. And I think, you know, the chair uh, mentioned it in opening remarks, you know, the last at the Four Towns meeting that we had back in December. Um, but I feel like we can't state it enough. Sure. Like we we kind of have to keep saying this over and over yeah. and over again because if we get to a point where the towns cannot agree on an assessment method and we end up in a place, like you said, where you know there's huge volatility from year to year, it's actually not benefiting any of the communities, um, 
it's not benefiting our students, it's not benefiting our schools, and it's certainly not benefiting the communities. So, you know, can we say that and in, in our meetings sure. and have that become part of our, our narrative and sure. should, we should be leading with that. You know, we don't want to get there, right? Like, let's actually then try to find a, a conversation that makes sense, you know? Um, anyway, I just, I, I feel like it's important enough for us to, for us to, to we can't overstate that. Ms. Kaczynski. So a couple of follow-ons. I, I agree we need to state it, and I think we need to, I think we've had a tendency to state it in terms of why it's bad for our school mm -hmm. as opposed to why it's bad for the towns and the taxpayers, right? Not being able to, to plan, having to make big cuts on elementary schools or police departments or fire departments to try to balance that budget. I don't think that message maybe quite is as clear. Yeah. Right? It's easy for us to say it really wrecks our school budget it's a little bit, okay. you know, more pointed to say what is it? What's the impact on your town when that happens? Can I respond? Sure. I think the hard part, and I think you're right. I think the hard part <coughs> of that is sometimes the the first year savings that some towns get is sort of tantalizing. They're like, oh, look at all, everything we could do. I think it's the out years where it's like, all right, well, once you get that one time savings, then you're in this really unpredictable place going forward. Um, so I think that's the challenge that we have to sort of illustrate. Right, and I think these charts go a long way to doing it and and I know why you don't have the statutory method in here but in terms of speaking to the to the public not just the leaders of the town I think it would be helpful to have a chart with the same assumptions that said if it were just the statutory method what's the swings that you're looking at um, just to complete the package okay. yes, sir. how much more time do we have five, five minutes. more minutes <laughs> I can so, do it five minutes. No, hold a second. so in five minutes Dear people watching this broadcast, <laughs> um, we're going to run out of battery power, which means we're not going to be recording anymore. Um, our meeting is going to continue because we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I apologize for the, the technical snafu that leaves us short of being able to film uh, the entire meeting. Um, there are going to be minutes for the full meeting that will be approved by the committee and published. And if there's a topic of particular and acute interest because it's further on the agenda, uh, in addition to looking at the minutes, I would welcome you reaching out um, to obviously the superintendent, uh, to Deb Westmoreland, who would have the minutes, uh, as well as also to myself, if you want to discuss this any further. I apologize for the inconvenience and appreciate um, your tuning in and watching our meetings and participating as a member of the public. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, th uh, thanks. Um, I think the. You know, the one reason why I don't do the full statutory is for the very reason of it's really hard to project. <laughs> um, you know, I could make some assumptions, but with that, the, the assumptions are truly sort of shots in the dark because you have to know right. reported because income levels. You have to know, you know, you how the new growth is going to. Yeah, data yeah, that. and we can do that, yeah, and we that. and we have, but we can um, we can put the historical data out there. Yeah. Mr. Menino, and then I think Mr. Deming. You partially answered my question. I understand why the adoption of the statutory method would have adverse budget implications, but why the volatility? Um, so when you're on the statutory method, a huge portion of the, well, not huge, about 60% of the assessment um, is based on a minimum contribution that the state calculates, and that minimum contribution changes pretty significantly, can change pretty significantly year to year um, for the four towns of our region. Um, so the w reasons why it changes. so. Enrollment. If there's a big um, sixth grade that moves to seventh grade and a you know twelfth grade that leaves, it could it could result in a really large increase. That happened for Leverett last year. Their uh, minimum contribution went up a hundred thousand um, dollars. There can also uh, every time EQV comes out, which is every two or three years, the new growth gets factored in. That can result in a huge swing in the minimum contribution. If you know one town had a lot of new growth, another town their their property is devalued, that can shift the the relationship. Um, and then income levels is the other one. So, and, there, and there's probably eight other factors that play into it, but those are the three big ones that um, create the volatility. It might be helpful to look at it historically so people mm -hmm. can get a view of it. I think it also helps make that case. Mr. Dillon? Um So yeah, so plus one on everything that Mr. Doyne and Ms. Kosensky said, uh, of leading with this theme of volatility. And, and I, I do really like that suggestion of using the back years, you know, to show what it would have been had, um, had the, the statutory method been in full effect to, to prove that volatility, sure. then you don't have to defend assumptions. Then that's, that's yeah. it is what it would have been. And it, and it may be a, useful to show, um, I mean, you can play around with it, but you know, if you were showing the back years of some of these models that had ceilings and floors about 
oh, but, and if, but if we had had this, then you would have had this amount of reduced volatility. I also think the volatility conversation and that problem is something everyone's going to be keenly aware of, particularly if they're not on like the school, school board. They'll, they'll understand the volatility impact of that, and it sets up the conversation about um, the, using the ceiling and the floor really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I, I think you could introduce those two variables. You know, do whatever spreadsheet uh, magic you want to do, you know, offline, and play around with that. Because there could be some really interesting combinations of how you, you know, maybe maybe the floor is zero percent. You know, maybe the, the ceiling is five percent, you know, and, and sort of tweak those, and, and then see what comes out in terms of you know back testing what it, how it would have been. I think. I think it really sort of sets up that, like, if you could sort of guarantee a bounded volatility, that's something people could live with a, a, more so, and that, that might be able to get people to let go of that first tantalizing year of, ooh, we saved 3% or more. So. Yeah, everything makes sense, and most of it is what we did. We've done, like, the last two, not the last working group, the two prior. I mean, that's exactly what we did. We looked at the statutory method, we went backwards, we went forwards, um, we project, you know, everything you said is exactly what we did, but we can pull that back out, we can update it. I think it's worth doing so. Ms. Spitzer, do you have anything? No, I don't think I have anything to add Okay. Uh, so I think our hope is that out of even possibly this Thursday, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's next Thursday, I think it's this it's Thursday, okay. um, that we're going to, we're, we, we, you know, the, obviously the groups, the folks coming back together are going to have some guidance for us on what they've heard and talked about. They're also going to have to go back out again. Um, <clears throat> this is not at a boil. You know, there's, I, there's the, the sort of the vibe I thought we had going was that people were looking for a solution that would, um, <coughs> that we could both have intermediate <coughs> point toward long term, but also protect our budget this year. Um, so. Any other questions? We'll move on. We got plenty of other stuff to do. Sure. <laughs> um, okay. So I don't see an issue. I don't see enrollment on our uh, on our. Yeah, I think it was just included as part of the assessment piece because it drives some of the formulas. Yeah, it sure does. It almost it, there was so much of it though. It was almost like <laughs> another, another whole you know agenda item in yeah. preparation or something. And yeah. sobering.